I wanted to begin just by um, um, referring to the picture on the, the painting on the cover of the book, which has a story to itself. But it's an image of a mountainous landscape, sensually presented in vivid colours, with deep sea water and freshwater lochs, living long straths of land forming bays and peninsulas around inlets. A natural and ancient world, but with a scattering of houses, a populated landscape, far from cities, but occupied by the lives of people, their loves, concerns, and particular dispositions throughout generations. The painting is entitled The Cullens Evening, April 1964, and it's painted by John Cunningham, who was my uncle. I worked for 14 years in New Zealand, and about 10 years into that sojourn on a return trip, John, my uncle, took me into his artist studio, showed me this painting, and he said, do you like it? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, it's yours. When you come back to live in Scotland, so that was the challenge. And when I came back to live in Scotland, he gave me the painting. And the painting is now on the cover of the book. But it has a meaning beyond the personal. And I wanted to begin with the anecdote because the book is a personal introduction to Scottish literature, this big subject. And the personal anecdote locates it. But I want to move out from there. And I want to ask John if he would come in for a moment and read just a few lines of the poem by Sorley MacLean called The Coolin which is depicted on the cover of the book. John, please. This is just four lines. A true e dochers, galus, coolverst, a keen is true lichig, gufurachar, gutrian vor, here and coolian, sagiri, er tu ille duke. Thank you. And sorry, McLean's. English translation, those lines go beyond misery, despair and hatred and treachery, beyond guilt and defilement, watchful, heroic. The Kuan is seen rising on the other side of sorrow. The poem was written in 1939, the beginning of the Second World War, and Maclean saw the rise of fascism in Europe coming through from 1936 in the Spanish Civil War into the 20th century, and in a sense, it's never gone away. That op the, the opposition that Maclean saw in the Kulin as a permanent symbol of resistance to all of these awful things that we still have to deal with in the world seemed to me a good way to begin by indicating not only the geographical terrain of Scotland, the language, the Gaelic language, Maclean's English translation, and we'll come, come on to mention the Scots language in a moment, but to begin by getting the coordinate points of what I want to say in this book. Throughout the 20th century, of course, most of the population of Scotland had already uh, moved into the cities. So Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dundee, what the painting indicates and what the beginning of the book insists upon is that we have Scotland as a place of natural beauty and symbolic authority, but we have to deepen our understanding with a sense of the historical complexity of a national identity before we can begin to encounter the richness of Scottish literature. So Scotland is a word that means a particular nation defined by geographical borders. But in the early 21st century, since the union of the crowns of Scotland and England in 1603 and the union of the parliaments of Edinburgh and London in 1707, this nation exists within the political state of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland with its global legacy of British imperialism. So Scotland can be imagined in two different dimensions, as part of a political state with its imperial political legacy, and as a single nation of separate, multifaceted cultural distinction, along with other nations in the world. So that's the premise with which the book begins, the idea that to explore Scottish literature in this way, you need to keep these two things in mind about where we are now. And the book isn't a, particularly a history of Scottish literature, nor is it a discussion only of the main themes that I find in Scottish literature. It's also an emphasis upon particular authors, particular themes, particular moments, particular historical characters and texts that for one reason or another, I've found to be worth emphasizing at this particular moment in history. Some of these things have been neglected. Some of them have been forgotten. Some of 
them have been deliberately obscured. And there has been over many generations an opposition to the idea of Scottish literature entirely. So in a way, the book is a redress, a reclamation of the validity and the value of a national literature. Now, I don't want to underestimate the quantity and quality of the scholarship that has accumulated on Scottish literature in many areas, in many eras, in many, many particular historical times. Over the last 20, 30, 50 years, there's been an immense amount of work done. But it still seems to me that there is this need to redress a situation of neglect. So the book is addressed, as far as I can make it uh, possible, to as wide a readership as possible, a general readership of anybody who's curious about the stories and the poems and the plays and connecting it with uh, the music and the artwork and the history of cultural production that Scotland has, has, has brought forth over generations, over decades, well, from since when? Where did it begin? Well, a long time ago, prehistoric, prehistoric, a prehistoric, pre-literate world, an oral culture, a, a world that came into existence over half a millennium, from before Columbus' time in the 6th century, through Kenneth MacAlpin in the 9th century, to Malcolm Canmore in the 11th century, when different groups of people of different languages and cultural preferences got to know more about each other and began to live together in a comedy of identity. Before them, there was the ice. Before that, before the people who came together, there was bird song. But before them, there was the ice. Identity is a function of position, and position is a function of power. And this is where we begin. But we also begin with that sense that McDermott conjoins us to remember. It requires great love of it deeply to read the configuration of a land. In other words, if you don't care about it, don't bother. It requires great love of it. It requires that engagement. It requires that slow and patient and timely saturation in the work in order to bring out the best of it. And whatever qualification I might bring to the subject, over 17 years since Paul Henderson Scott of the Salt and Earth Society, after a, an event at the Edinburgh Book Festival, said, said to me, would you write a book about literature, about Scottish literature? I think that's the book that needs to be written. A personal, a personal view, a personal introduction to the whole of it. Of course, there are many areas here I'm treading very carefully upon. There are many areas I'm not a specialist in. There are many areas where I know I've made mistakes and, and will make mistakes. But the principle of the book is that all of this material is approachable. All of this is approachable. You can, it, it should be accessible. You have to respect the specialities. You have to respect the scholarship. You have to take great care and go do your homework and take great pains about going into the, the details of all of these areas. But it is art. The approachability of art is on, based on the principle of giving. The, you know, the, first, the, first, the first priority of advertising, the first priority of a commercial society is to take, to take something off you, to take money from you. The principle of all art, at least since the French Revolution, is giving. It's there for you to find out about, to do your homework, to study. And it's hard work sometimes, study difficult work. These are the challenges, but it's always valuable, always invaluable. So if the scholarship that's in the book is formidable over a long period of time, I'm hoping that the text of the book will be approachable and readable and bring into purview the whole of the, of the, of the world of Scottish literature that I can imagine, that I can bring to the page. And that fundamental thing, what, what it is, what literature is. I think I've got one little sentence here that sums it up, I think. It's a form of resistance. The act, the expression of literature is to resist all efforts, all vain efforts to bind and contain imaginative life. It's to resist the mechanical excess of systematic meaning. And goodness knows, if I, if I have achieved anything in this book, it's to worry 
bureaucracy. It's to teach that intelligence and sensitivity reside within an irreducible openness and never with the close. Never with the close. So the book itself is a <laughs> 734 pages. So I began by saying that I'm really indebted to Gavin McDougall and Lewis Press for bringing this out. And all of the people who worked on it towards the, just before the completion date, the publication date, particularly Jenny Renton and Ailey and Rachel and all of the people who are with us. Um, but at 734 pages, Gavin McDougall told me it's the biggest book we have both have ever produced. I'm just hopeful it's not so big that it'll weight the ship down too much. But as I say, the approachability of it should be paramount. So it's divided into particular sections. The book begins with three questions asking what is Scottish literature? How it could be described, if not defined? What's literature? Well, I've given one answer to that. There are a few others in the book. And was there ever a British literature? And I'm afraid I think the answer to that is probably no. The answer to whether there was a British literature depends entirely upon the understanding of the word British. That's a very contentious term. And with regard to the particularity of literature and the particularity of any of the arts, I will argue that the answer to that question is no. These are contentious ways to begin. The second part of the book talks about Scotland before it was Scotland. As I said, before, before Scotland, there were these people. Before they were there, there was the ice. So what happens as the people come together slowly from the Scandinavian countries, from the Gaelic-speaking countries, that comity between Ireland and Scotland, what we now call Ireland and Northern Ireland and Scotland, and the commerce between these areas, cultural and linguistic commerce, that saturates the West of Scotland in such particular ways should never be denied. It comes through the stories of Arthur and Merlin and Calgacus from the Romans in Scotland and our earliest recorded poem, Godotten, Columba coming, I mentioned, so on, all these formative areas. Then very simply, there are, there's a, a third section dealing with the three genres of poetry, plays and drama, which has been hugely researched since the last major publications on Scottish literature, huge areas have been brought into light and ways of thinking about play, theatricality and drama. And finally, stories and novels, storytelling and, and fiction. Central part of the book is a whole set of chapters on authors and works where the principle is compare and contrast. To begin with, I'm introducing material to readers who might not be familiar with it at all. And I'm thinking as I thought, when I was working in New Zealand, how to introduce this material to people who've never encountered it before, uh, who might be openly curious about it, but who have no expertise and no investment in it. And just because I think it's worthwhile, that there's so much to learn from about being alive. That's the first principle of the early chapters. But then it goes into individual chapters dealing with regeneration as it happens across centuries. So that in particular, when Alan Ramsey in the 18th century, reprints, republishes the work of William Dunbar. There's a kind of regeneration that happens right there. And Ramsey leads to Ferguson and Ferguson leads to Burns. And Burns, in a way, leads to Scott and the regeneration of the idea of Scotland in the early 19th century that he portends. And then through that intense process of industrialization and the rise of the empire through the 19th century, colonialism, imperialism, in the 1920s, in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, McDermott and what I'm calling, or what has been called, what we call the Scottish literary renaissance. A renaissance, the word is correct, regeneration, that's what it's about, rebirth, rediscovering the past, reclaiming it and renewing what we can do in the future. Retrieval and renewal in Edwin Morgan's um, words. So the latter part of that section brings together more contemporary writers, bring them together, in, in separate chapters, just looking at the contrast, the old, a very old traditional literary um, technique, compare and contrast, and just see what, what individuality is brought out among the writers that we, that we read for pleasure and for intellectual gain and knowledge. Part five is a section I've entitled Divagations. It's Ezra, an Ezra Pound term suggesting diversions, diversities of inquiry. And the um, 
spirit, the, the, the term might be Ezra Pounds, but the spirit is Hugh McDermott's, that openness of inquiry. And that lead, leads us to the last section, is the loose canon, um, a new canon of Scottish literature, which is expansive, and roaming about, bringing things in, not closing things off, an invitation. And finally, a gazetteer. This is a book with a map, same as Kidnap, Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnap. So it's that sense of you can travel all around the country to find these things. There's so much more I could say, but I just wanted to give you a shape, an outline of the book as a whole before opening up the conversation a wee bit. So I think I'll start now and invite Fiona to join me, uh, Fiona Stafford, to join us from Oxford and to see if we can um, begin our conversation and open it up a bit. Fiona, welcome. Thanks. Good to see you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Alan for inviting me um, and I think invite is the kind of key word really for your book as well isn't it I mean it's called Scottish Literature an Introduction that perhaps could have been a provocation but I think really it's an invitation isn't it it's an invitation to ev everybody um, to come and just enjoy this amazingly you know rich rich culture that, that you're you're leading people through but leading through in a very kind of individual way that's one of the things I really enjoyed about it and um I think anybody who's been listening to you um just just in the last 20 minutes uh will get a flavor of the book because I think that's one of the things that's striking about it um you might look at the book and beautiful as it is with with um with the painting you've been talking about um, but you might think it's it's some sort of reference book or it's going to be a kind of scholarly anthology or, or, or whatever. But actually what you get is a really, really exciting ride that's just full of ideas. Um, and, and you've shared some of the ideas, some of the key ideas, but there's there's just lots more. Um, so I think it's an incredibly engaging book. And also I think the way you've structured it um, and the way you've described, but also with with quite a lot of shortish uh, chapters with very kind of interesting pairings of writers makes it really really accessible um but one of the things i i enjoyed most about it which is i think come out very much in the way you, you've chosen to introduce it is that sense of your personal enjoyment of the literature um uh, and there are moments all the way through where that comes out in different ways i mean there's that wonderful moment where you describe i think when you're 18 or something, di discovering Hugh McDermott and just coming across a drunk man and, and the effect that that had on you. Um, and, and it's really kind of enlivening and, uh, and, and personal. It, it, there isn't a sort of detachment from the literature. Um, and it comes out in other ways as well. So some of the, your turns of phrase uh, just are really quite electrifying and make you think. There's a moment where you're talking about um, Hogg's Confessions, for example, and you talk about how those those questions lodge like fish hooks very deep um, and those, those kind of moments in the book um, they're, they're different aspects of your response but they're they're very very kind of powerful I mean when, when you talk about Sidney Graham as well uh, there's, there's a real kind of sense of your feeling and how moved you are by by his work and I think that's very, very inviting. Um, it, it, it's um, it, it's kind of inviting your reader to to go and read read the literature, which it, which is wonderful. But but we would be reading it with your your voice in in, in mind. Um, and, and one of the things I'd really love to hear, I don't know whether we'll have time, would be to hear hear you read your own poem that that you you hold until very near the end. You know, drawn back by magic, um, because I think that that does actually sum up a lot of what you're saying in a in a very sort of distilled way and seems to me very much what you're you know what you're talking about through the book because it, it is a wonderful introduction to Scottish literature but it's also um it's it's very much about art in general isn't it you, you talk a lot about music um uh, actual actual music or the music of the language and the different the different languages that you're talking about that all go into making out this kind of Scottish literature, which in some ways is a kind of umbrella term as well as a very specific one, isn't it? Though you might not like me saying that. Um, but also also the art as well, the visual art as well. So that that sort of idea of you know camera or paintbrush or pencil or pen, you know that 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 idea I think is one of the things that's very attractive about about the book. Um, but I wondered. Um, I mean, I think we're going to move on to John immediately after me. But I would be really interested um, to hear you talk a little bit more about your sort of sense of Scottish literature having moved from Scotland um, because you know you talk about how you actually you know were born in Scotland then moved out of Scotland quite early and then you came back um, and then you were in New Zealand 
And it, it, it struck me that that was interesting to think about in relation to what you say um, when you're talking about Benjamin and storytelling and the different kinds of storyteller, the, the storyteller who's a, a, a traveller or a wanderer um, and the, the storyteller who stays at home uh, and, and those two different kinds of storytelling. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps say a bit about that in terms of the reader, the critic uh, as, as well and your, your sense of, of Scotland whether it's kind of been intensified by being really on the other side of the world um, or, or whether whether you think you would have, I mean, this is a bit hypothetical, but whether you'd have felt the same about it had you just stayed in Scotland um, th throughout, because you've obviously got this real kind of attachment to uh, the Scottish landscape, which comes across very, very strongly. And, and your sense of all the different perspectives in Scotland, I wonder if they're intensified by having been really quite a long way away from it or not so I'd, I'd be interested to hear you, hear you talk a little bit about that uh, but there's Hi. so much to talk about um I will stop at this point <laughs> thanks so much thanks so much Fiona that's wonderful very generous of you to say so much to say these things um yes uh the answer is yes um I, I've been very lucky uh, I've been very lucky um I guess I kind of hesitate to say this but I'm going to say it anyway I was very lucky to have been born in Airdrie of all places, deepest, darkest, neo-sectarian, post-industrial Lanarkshire, which to me growing up with the family that I had all around me, my grandparents and so on, was an adventure playground of not like nothing else. I mean, there, was, there was so much of the territory to explore. And my grandfather's enormous bookcase that you could literally almost have climbed into as a wee boy and his encouragement of that, my father's encouragement, my parents' encouragement of all the reading and then I that sense of the, the Benjamin's Benjamin's idea of the storyteller being someone who travels and then the other kind of storyteller someone who stays and learns all about the place and that always struck me as both of these aspects are entirely desirable that there's you need to you need to be outside the country in order to appreciate it in order to to criticize it forcefully and say that we're not doing this right get a grip do something more here why is it that Poland has a Mickiewicz Institutional Institute for its, its art or, or, you know, the, 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 the gallery for Edvard Munch? Is these people are celebrated in such a way. Why is there no such equivalent for McDermott or for Elizabeth Melville, the first Scottish poet whose book was first published, the first Scottish woman poet of a book published in 1603? These discoveries that one makes in the, in the inquiry. Working in New Zealand, when I remember teaching the Scottish literature course there, putting on the video and showing the Sheviet stag and the black, black oil. And Maori students coming to me and saying, that's our story too. You're telling our story. So it's very particular to Scotland in the Highlands and the devastations that Highlanders themselves would wreak in Australia, for example. But it's also a universal story that has application in, in other parts of the world through that, through that trajectory of the empire and all that, that connects it. And the sense of, I think, what I'd like to say about the sense of landscape is to remember Edward Dorn, the great American poet, Ed Dorn, who reminded me once, he said, it's not, you're not really talking about landscape. You're coming out of a history from, from Ezra Pound and McDermott and through the early 20th century, what you're talking that their hero as a writer, their, the model in a way of, for their writing was Thomas Hardy. And the Hardy sense of landscape isn't so much just landscape, it's about what's haunted. It's about what haunts you. And if you come to live in Scotland and stay in a particular place, that landscape can provide that sense of what has gone before. Who, who are the people who have lived here before? What are those ruins really all about? What's that? The haunted quality of some parts of this country is palpable. And that, that comes through. And I think, thanks especially for saying what you said about the personal aspect of it. I mean, let me, there's maybe two things I can quote to illustrate this. One is, um, uh, from my account of the satire of the three estates, um, which of course is a, one of the great plays and one of the major works of Scottish literature and a kind of paragon that so much theatre can be can refer to and learn from. And what I've said about it is when I went to the Assembly Hall in Edinburgh in 1984 with my parents to see the Tom Fleming production performed by almost all of Scotland's greatest actors of the era, it was a revelation to me of what large-scale theatre could do. 
So uh, from Andrew Cruikshank, if you remember, some of the some of the people here, I think, will remember Dr. Finley's casebook, and the old Dr. Cameron was um, Andrew Cruikshank, all the way through to Gregor Fisher and Phil McCall, the pardoner. And Phil McCall, playing the poor man, throws the pardoner, Walter Carr, off the stage for his lying duplicity. He, land, he landed, I mean, this is what I remember. I'm sitting next to my parents. Walter Carr, the pardoner, lands on the floor in front of my mother. He's carrying a huge, the jawbone of a cow, very clearly, which he's been to sell as a, as, a, as a relic of Christ. And he looks just, he just looks around spontaneously, spots my mother and he says, hey, missus, could you not make a great bowl of soup out of this? And the whole audience, you know, just spontaneous laughter, but it relates absolutely to what the play is about and the hypocrisy that's going on here and the challenge that's going on here. And it's that sense of, you know, we're so caught up in, um, mass media frenzies of politics that pass by as if they're really important. When a play like that actually catches that moment just before the Reformation, holds it there and you can see what's going on and you have time to contemplate it as well. It's immediately vivid, but you have time to contemplate it and think about it as well. So the, the other thing that maybe sums up my response to what you're saying is that just four lines from a poem by McDermott. And he says this, the effort of culture is towards greater differentiation of perceptions and desires and values and ends, holding them from moment to moment in a perpetually changing but stable equilibrium. So the stability that culture is kind of holding forth is something that all art and all literature and all of the arts in some way embody. Uh, that's not to say that they're not responsive to completely um, historical moments and that they're not um, in tune or um, resistant to particular uh, historical um, political uh, desires or, or drives. But if it's good work, if it's good art, if it's good literature, it opens up that space for you to think about it. I think that, that maybe answers some of the questions. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll invite John to come in and join us too, because there are other aspects that he might bring to the conversation. John, here you are. Hi. Yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'd uh, like to say I've just thoroughly enjoy reading this book. It's, it's a bloody good read. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's also challenged me to do things that I should have done a long time ago and never did, uh, namely read Gavin Douglas's uh, translation of the Aeneid. And it too is a bloody good read. And actually during the process of reading it, I began to understand partly through what you wrote yourself about it, uh, your own approach to translation, because what you have done in this book has been linguistically extraordinarily generous. Most approaches to the history of Scottish literature, indeed assumptions as to what it is, completely ignore Gaelic completely ignore Latin or practically ignore Latin, have forgotten that Welsh was the language for, you know, several hundred years in southern Scotland and the oldest poem in Welsh was almost certainly written in Scotland. So there's this kind of generosity and you have been generous to the extent that uh, you have actually got material in Gaelic in it, not just in translation, so that a Gaelic reader for once is picking up a book on the history of Scottish literature and actually sees their own language in it now and again. Um, I, I do miss some Latin actually, uh, when you do the next edition, uh, put in some Latin would be good. Uh, there, there, is, there, is, there is some Latin, there is some Latin, oh, but not, not, for, not very much. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, it is a terrific read, it's very generous and it's also generous artistically in the sense that you are aware very much aware of uh, music and painting. And so much of Scottish history, I don't want to sound negative too much about uh, our uh, fellow historians, but so much of it is very much focused on their bit of the subject as it were, and they do not see the culture as a whole, or if they do see the culture as a whole, they don't think it appropriate to put it in their book. And you think it's appropriate. But the other thing that is uh, uh, appropriate is your enthusiasm. And that's what really brings the whole thing to life. 
I spent my life reading academic books and learning a huge amount from them and enjoying them thoroughly in many respects, but missing time after time, missing the joy of the reader in the material they're talking about, whether it be music or painting or whatever, analytical, whereas in this it is joyous and it is positive. That's not to say it's uncritical. You have plenty of critical acumen, but the, another great thing about this book is that where you go for critical comment is not just to the usual suspects. Uh, and for instance, as, as a, a lover of Gallic culture, I take particular delight in your treatment of Dr. Johnson, who gets the up, come up and <laughs> he thoroughly <laughs> deserves. Um, so I would say it's, it's really an outstanding uh, uh, piece of work and encyclopedic uh, and generous in its whole nature. Uh, hearty congratulations. Thanks so much, John. That's well. I don't really have much criticism to answer there. I guess I, I, I feel I feel embarrassed and and and, and um, very grateful. Um, but I do. Maybe I should respond in one particular way. I'm tre as I said. I'm treading very tenderly on some of this territory uh, because I'm not a I'm not a fluent I'm not a Gaelic speaker, although my name is a Gaelic word. And the study that I've done of Gaelic and the and the the conversations and the homework that I've done with scholars and with um, other Gaelic with Gaelic poets, uh, you know, th trying to think of how the language works, and with yourself, you know, talking about music and words and translation from the, the composition of Duncan Van McIntyre's Praise of Ben Doran as a musical structure rather than a literary structure. All of these things. I, I, you know, to that degree, I'm I'm familiar with and confident about speaking about, but I realise it's very ten tender ground, and I'm not I'm not an expert. So on the one hand, I'm very grateful to you for 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 acknowledging the enthusiasm and the and the and the you know the infectiousness, the contagiousness of the pleasures of it, but I'm also feeling a bit vulnerable sometimes when it comes to these matters. Well, I, I, I wouldn't feel too vulnerable. I mean, you're always going to get people on the sidelines who won't be entirely happy with everything. That's inevitable. I've experienced that with uh, Scotland's music, you know, and my praise for uh, 19th century Scottish composers has been rather poo-pooed. And I have had to draw in, uh, you know, the opinions of people from other countries saying, well, actually, it's rather good. But with respect to you, for instance, your translations of Gallic, of which you've put quite a lot in, um, I drew a parallel there with Gavin Douglas, and uh, Gavin Douglas, um, you know, wrote a lot more than than um, was originally in in the Aeneid. Um, it's longer, and it's I may say I think it's livelier. Um, but also you have the other example with uh, something of the wit and bravery that you exhibit now and again and what you're prepared to quote of Sir Thomas Urquhart of that ilk and Urquhart translated Rabelais uh, and where Rabelais has, you know, descriptions of three cod pieces or four cod pieces for Gargantua, uh, Sir Thomas has half a dozen of them, uh, I won't go into detail, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Suffice it to say that it is it is copious. The book is copious. Uh, it's a word you would use of Urquhart, and it's a word that uh, I would use of your book. It's a copious book. That's that's exactly what I was hoping you would say. And, and <laughs> I'd also, if you want to, please. Yeah, if I just come in on on this, Alan, I, I think you've just got such a good ear, being a poet, that the you know the quotations that you include. Um, are always, always fabulous and, and beautiful. So, um, you know, you may not have written the definitive book on every single author who appears um, or writer who, who appears, but because you've got such a kind of good ear um, and also you've got this sort of personal take on it, um, that's incredibly, um, you know, interesting to interesting to to, to read it's it, it, it's great um i mean one thing i did have a question about is because um you know you're you're obviously very inclusive i mean just remarkable as as john said it's encyclopedic um did you have to kind of keep restraining yourself because i i mean i think we all have writers we prefer to others and i can see that the temptation was to put in you know 
longer chapters or a bit more on X, Y, and Z. But you know, you're you're, you're being, as I say, very inclusive. Um, so so how how did you approach that particular problem of this is my favourite, so I want to write twice as much on this one. Um, well, I I I kind of um, I indulged myself a little bit and chose favourites. But as I said, the principle at the beginning that there are neglected authors or authors that have been obscured or forgotten that I wanted to bring back into, into sight. There are some who I, I ran out of space or, or um, I mentioned in the, in the loose canon at the end of the book, there are a few names that aren't discussed in the book. But again, the whole thing is really just an indication. It's an invitation, as you said at the start. The idea is that you could come in and invite yourself in to look further in different directions. And um, and there are particular, yeah, I mean, it, it, it still seems to me that talking to people internationally, there's an immediate recognition of the quality of, for example, McDermott. Hugh McDermott as a poet, uh, alongside W.B. Yeats, alongside contemporaries and in the, in, the, in, the, in the whole pantheon, um, which in Scotland sometimes is more locally pulled down as it were it's, 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 it's sometimes easier to see one of the giants if you're far away if, you know if you're if you're looking at something monumental it's easier to get a, the whole scale of it if you're looking at it from a distance rather than being ground up against its face all the time and that's true but then there's a kind of um i don't know a, a sort of a spirit of inquiry a kind of just just look further all i can do with this is put it together as a habit and it's and other people will take it will take it further. That's that's the that's I guess in a way that's the humility of it. That's the sense of it's not it's not my job now to it's not my job to be comprehensive or to write the definitive book about all of these things, but to show that they're there. Um, there's a there's a little quotation from uh, James Robertson's um, novel with the great title "To Be Continued." Dot dot dot, um, which contains one of the lovely loveliest characters in modern fiction, I think. Um, Mungo, um, Mungo Fourth Mungo is his full name, and he's a telepathic talking toad who confronts the um, main character and runs with him throughout the book. And they have a dialogue in the middle of the gar a garden at night when um, Mungo interrupts uh, the main character, Douglas, and he says, "Do you not? Do you or do you not subscribe to the view that all knowledge?" is potentially valuable and that its value, potential or realized, cannot be determined by the superficial assessment of its perceived utility at any given moment. And I have to think about that, says Douglas. It seemed too grand and complex a proposition to be unscrambled so late in the garden of an, of an October darkness, especially after the best part of a bottle of red wine. Do so, Mungo said. I already have. And in one untoward light leap, he left the table and landed somewhere in the night. And I've repeated the actual, the, the phrase, it's almost as if it's a motto. All knowledge is potentially valuable and its value, potential or realized, cannot be determined by the superficial assessment of its perceived utility at any given moment. Well, I think Mungo the Toad has some wisdom in a, in a statement like that. It's, it's a very important statement and uh, it's been a guiding light for me too, in studying the history of Scottish music, and I think you have followed the same principles. That is to say that you have not gone around assessing the quality or validity of things, either by uh, their previous assessments or by their, their length or whether they're well known or not. So there are all sorts of little gems that pop in. There's, there's a poem by uh, Montrose, which I'd never read. I didn't even know he was a writer, for goodness sake. And it's an absolutely beautiful little poem uh, and, and a, a very sharp little comment too. Uh, <clears throat> you'll, you'll know where it is. But these kind of, of little bits and pieces, which mm. might be readily regarded as extraneous or unimportant, in actual fact, give immense vivacity mm. to the whole story. Um, and from that point of view, it is not just a linguistically generous, it is also generous in terms of uh, the people who are accepted as representing uh, quality writing in Scotland. 
Um, so yes, that's that's uh, another big plus of this book that one is often surprised by little gems that one didn't even know existed. Well, thanks again. It's good to have good to have these wee gems. I mean, I, there's, I, have, I was self-consciously dropping things in that might actually prompt, you know, as Fiona quoted what I said about W. S. Graham's poem Loch Tom and other of Graham's Sydney Graham's poems that they actually they hook you. They're like fish hooks. They go in deep and they don't come out. And you know, they, and I guess you know, thinking right back to what you were saying at the beginning, that um, the for, the good fortune that I had to be encouraged in reading. And the book is about Scottish literature, but it's really an encouragement to all reading. Um, my early recollections of my father giving me a copy of Moby Dick and reading the whole thing and coming to the end of it. And when Ahab goes over the side, I still remember that sense of what, what? Your, your breath is taken from you. Uh, you know, Mark Twain and Huckleberry Finn, um, Jim going down the river on the raft and that sense of let's drift along. We've got a big world to contend with and it's it's pretty grim, but we're floating down the river and let's just see what happens with the current. Um, and then but these wee dots of, you know, that, that, that I'm thinking too of um, the musical aspect of it. And I'm very glad to bring in not only F.G. Scott, who was a, a kind of very important figure for McDermott and for Edwin Muir, um, but uh, also Ronald Stevenson and also Eric Chisholm. And I know you're, you're one of the great modernist composers and your work on Eric Chisholm, John, has been terrific. And all of this is part of the redress of, um, of what we understand to be modern Scottish culture, but modern, modern culture more broadly. Um, you know, we, we know that Chisholm in South Africa, the work was neglected and now it's coming back, but it's still Still a long way to go before it enters the, the, the repertoire. And when Ronald Stevenson sets McDermott's lyric about the, it's just beautiful little verse. Better a Gowden lyric than the castle shore and wall. Better a Gowden lyric than anything else of all. And that, that turn away from warmongering and militarism and violence and thinking about what a lyric is and what, what music is and what poetry can do to convey that in that deep way as part of, I think, what, what we're on about. Yes, and you also mentioned Jimmy McMillan's beautiful setting of the William Souter. The William Souter poem, yeah. Yeah, the trace. Yes. Yeah, all of these things. <laughs> and it's interesting that, in fact, Jimmy has a music festival which he calls the Cumnock Trace. Trace, that's right. Trace. Right. So these things are all, they're, they're all connected. The, you know, the arts are not foreign to each other. Um, I'll read, Fiona asked me to read the, the poem, I'll, I'll, re, I'll read this and then we can open up a bit further, maybe if, uh, if we have other questions as well. So the poem, this is, I, I come to the end of the main section on uh, authors and works and talking about the whole range of poems, poets that are writing now. Um, difficult to, to say that any single one stands so high above the others, but it's all in this dialogue. It's not a competition, but it's all in this um, conversation of uh, priorities. And I draw to an end with Kathleen Jamie's uh, poem called Crossing the Loch. And when, they, when she describes herself and her, the, the, people, the, the people on the boat jumping ashore at the end of the water crossing, the water is phosphorescent and beautiful, shining on fingers and floors and the passengers are like pilgrim saints making a crossing to another place a destination from which they will enter their futures. And this poem, Crossing the Loch, I think is fantastic because it has that multiple, the, the, the multiplicity of tenses in it. Mm. So it's a moving poem, it's about moving on water, you know, as, as in the Berlin of Conranald, the great Gallic poem. Most poems, you think of Wordsworth, or you think of Dante's Divine Comedy, they're at walking pace. And Burns's Tam O'Shanter, you know, in the, in the chase, it's about riding on a horse, a horseback, galloping. These poems, this, this poem is about movement on water and then disembarking. The glimmering anklets we wore in the shallows as we shipped oars and jumped to draw the boat in safe, high at the cottage shore. The boat may be safe, the travellers are sure, but the wild is still there. And the autonomous region is always in need of new creation. 
It is what poetry does, it's what all the arts do. So my own poem is called Drawn Back by Magic. And maybe it's an appropriate summary of what the, the whole book is about. Um, of the work of the artist or writer, especially that of the poet. Whatever the hand holds, camera, paintbrush, pencil, pen, fingertips upon the laptop's keys, the paper, screen or canvas, and the air the senses carry in. Make traces, tracks, a patterning that moves out from the place and its location on the clock to be caught, glimpsed, held on, whatever may be, and at whatever time, but never trapped. This is what work we do. What help it might be crosses then to now. But it is not only that, it also brings you back. Something unplanned, intuitive, relaxed, working in the bones and muscle way below the memory of things. Abstraction, yet as real as that salt spray that hit you like a shower switched on when the ferry smashed the crosswave and a blast of blue and green turned white as frost and drenched you in a sudden cold as if all resolution, steel and ice were sensitized. To see, and then to see again. What has changed and what remains? And by whatever chance and will should be, what's drawn back by magic. <laughs> yes. Ma magic is what you can't explain. And there's always something magical about, you know, you spent maybe 17 years writing a book or putting it together and the whole genesis of the book through, through Paul Scott's first prompt to its iterations in various capacities for possible publishers. And then its version, the versions of many of these chapters were um, published in different form in the newspaper, The National, over a number of years. And that the idea that the National is the only newspaper in Scotland which supports Scottish independence is, a, is a, an amazing fact, which when I mention this to other people when I'm traveling internationally, that only one newspaper supports what half the population, of, at least half the population of the country are committed to. That whole, you know, the whole volatile political question that's there seemed to me to require redress. And I remember saying to the editor way back then, um, I think it was in 2016 when I started with that, was if you're going to think of an independent Scotland in a new future, then you've got to have a major place in your newspaper for the arts. So I'll do something for you. I won't do it regularly. I won't do it every week. But it turned out that I pretty much did with contributions from John and from Sandy Moffat and from others. It's been a whole long running series of just exploring. There's no end to the possibilities. And then the whole thing was revised finally to the publication of the book. And now that the book's there, there's that sense of something. Did I did I do that? Is that what, what have I done? This is a kind of magical thing that I can't explain. So I'm kind of in the business now of trying to. Well, I've got to read it all and pick up the typos and the mistakes, and there are one or two, but not very many so far. But um, but I'm gonna I, I, I'll let you into a wee secret before I before I go. But I want to pause just in case. Thomason or Ailey want to come in if there's any particular questions that you've spotted in the chat that I need to we need to address. Yeah, think... we've got some we've got some good questions here. Um okay. so the first one that I see is as a reference piece, it has many quotable discussions, but academia aside, it is simply a good read. As one of Professor Rio State senior honour students at Glasgow it's great to read his vision um so that's a very kind comment and then a uh, question is do you think the Scottish tradition pre-late 20th century has been underestimated or is it really something that was strangled at birth by the reformation as many people believe and that question comes from Joseph Farrell thanks Joe yes that's a good question it's that sense that I think the answer is yes and no. I think the answer is still to be completely discovered. As I said, there's an enormous amount of research that's just gone on over the last 20 years, particularly, 
um, and maybe 30 years. But before that, the idea that the theatre had been stopped by the Reformation was very familiar and not entirely true. And it's now being re, re, you know, reconsidered. What is what was the theatre history of Scotland? Much more complex and much more obscure uh, than we have been led to believe. So I think the answer is there's a there is a truth in that idea, but it's not the whole truth, and the discoveries are ongoing. Uh, if you take somebody like <clears throat> Robert Ferguson, who died so young and is uh, known for his lament in the death of Scots music which might seem as though he had been driven into a corner of a purely uh, uh, indigenous style of music. He was very keen on opera uh, and uh, that was going on in Edinburgh at the time. And at his time, uh, you know, aristocratic young women were learning to sing complex operatic arias. And that picture of what was going on musically in Scotland was very complicated. And that applies also when you've got somebody like Ferguson, where you've got the interplay between words and music. And to suggest that, it, it, uh, you know, the Reformation screwed it all up, I think is, is pretty, pretty harsh and not just not true. I mean, you know, when you've got Burns and, and uh, <coughs> Robert Louis Stevenson and people like this, you, you, you really, you know, it just doesn't stack up. I think I think the creativity, you know, I think that I think that creativity, you know, is essential. That people find ways to express themselves, even in whatever circumstances. Circumstances change, and the dynamic nature of what human beings are does mean that circumstances will change. So, if it's a change into something that we don't like, there are ways to resist that and move around it, even through uh, oppressive circumstances. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe quote something at the end to illustrate that. But I see there's a question from Beth. Thanks, Beth, Beth Tuner, asking about the future. What, what, if I'm foreseeing anything coming, what sense I might have of what's on the horizon and what I look forward to? Well, um, I don't know. It seems to me there are uh, a number of things that, that I do speculate towards the end of the, of the book after the session called the, the section called the loose canon what does the future portend and there are it seems to me a, a couple of things a couple of things that are very clear and obvious one is technology the the means of publication have changed so radically over the last 30 years that it's now a different medium a different a different, a different media uh, portends and yet still there is that sense of what the words are and to go back to what John was saying, uh, or what we were saying about music and translation and words in the Gaelic tradition, particularly, it's not just the words on the page, it's the words in your head. And as soon as the words are in your head and you're able to record, to, to, to remember them and then to bring them forth again into the air, you're creating music. And that sense of something that's entirely dependent upon the physicality of the body is essential. So all of this nanotechnology and screens and and the, the, the wonderful aspects of Zoom is part of the story and it's pervasive, but it's not only, the only thing. The other thing that I think is absolutely pervasive is ecology. And the whole circumstance of the climate and the culture of ecology that we're much more aware of now, that's much more a subject. You know, I refer to the wild being still there in Kathleen Jamie's poem and in, in various aspects of my own poetry. That sense that you, we now know not only we can't get away from it, it's inside as well as out there, but we mustn't get away from it. We've got to keep this in mind. It's a responsibility. So the aspect of it. There's also, you know, in a very general way, pluralities, pluralities of languages, of, of cultural and sexual and dispositions of preference, dispositions of character, um, which I think are becoming more more visible, more, 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 more sympathetic in a way, perhaps than they were 50, even 50 years ago. So all of these prospects are opening up possibilities, but it still depends upon what, what the creative, what the creative spirit can do. You know, it's not a matter of prediction anymore. It can't be, it can't be a matter of prediction. I'm noting Tom Hubbard talking about F.G. Scott and kind kit it. wow that would be a great to hear that for this you know fg scott's um uh renaissance overture and other things which i haven't heard of, but I, there's still more research to be done one of the um one of the facts of the whole what scottish literature is 
is that there's still more to find in, in the National Library and the libraries and the, in the music, Scottish Music um, Centre. What recover, retrieval, renewal, all of this is there and still to come. And we're, we're beginning to run out of time. Um, I just want to make sure that we get this in. Um, the I think very quickly, I think that a big word of congratulation should go to Lua Press for bringing yeah. the book out as well as they have. So, yeah. and clap yeah, yeah. to them. Absolutely. It's a, it's, I'm so, I mean, there are occasionally, occasionally in the past I've, I've um, had a book produced which I wasn't entirely satisfied with, but I'm really satisfied with this one. Thanks to Lua Press, as I said at the beginning, everybody is. Who's um thanks, Peter Arnold. It's just Peter's just put a comment there. Terrific. Okay, two two brief things to finish with. I'm gonna let you into a secret now. There's an embed an embedded um quotation in the book, or not quotation, citation or reference, just simply reference. When I was at school, my school teacher of English, one of the best teachers ever. And I had to, the two, the book is dedicated to the teachers. It's for, it's for, if I can help anything in that regard, that's what it's for. And so much depends upon having good teachers. And the people I've listed, my own, some of my own best teachers at the beginning of the book are named. The two names that begin that list are still alive, still with us, still very much with us. And I met them by good fortune um, to have a drink and a meal with last weekend. My school, my school teacher, there was a man called Tim Cribb who taught me at the University of Cambridge. And there was a man called Edward Stead who taught me in school. Now, Edward Stead told us there that if we're in an exam and we really needed to impress the examiner, we weren't sure, make up a quotation. Put it in quotation marks and refer it as having been pronounced by the great critics, Hecken Looper and Voss. And he said, your examiner will read this and they'll say, and Heckenloop, who, what? But Voss, no, Voss is serious. So the Heckenlooper and Voss are the great critics. And I've got them here referring to Lavinia Derwent's Tammy Trout story, ch children's stories, uh, versions of Greyfriars Bobby and her books of Tammy Trout and Tammy Trout's capers. The world can be all bad if we're still in it, Auntie Lavinia almost wrote. Her works are recommended and summed up in one word by those great, now sadly almost forgotten, literary critics, Egan Looper and Voss. Indispensable. So I'm not going to give you the page reference, but you'll find it somewhere in these 734 pages of this book. It's designed to worry scholars and, and really convulse bureaucrats to have these references. But I'll end, I'll end with um, just the very ending of the book. The ending of the book is a quotation from um, Ben Ockrey, but I add to it. Ben Ockrey says this, culture during a time of political impotence can become kitsch, but it can also function as continual declaration and resistance. Now that's true, but it goes further. So I'm adding this short paragraph to end with. And even during times of political confidence, confirmation and self-determination, the work of culture, the arts and literature continues to sensitize us to the world, to deliver news of permanent value and to keep lively a constant and healthy resistance to all that would diminish the wealth of our complexity and purpose. So that's what the book is for, and what's the, that's what it's about. And I want to thank Fiona immensely, and I want to thank John hugely, and I want to thank everybody who's born with us thus far, and who I know will be signing up to buy copies, multiple copies to give us presents, and to keep Lewis in business, and, um, and to sustain the work that we do. Thanks so much.